Good evening, and thank you for joining us on World Gynecologic Oncology Awareness Day for our educational webinar with Dr. Devin Miller. Um, she will discuss how improvements in clinical research and care have increased available screening options and created more targeted treatment options against gynecologic cancers, um, such as cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. My name is Blake Belden, and I'm a member of VCU Massey Cancer Center's marketing communications team. Before we begin the presentation, um, I would just like to note that we'll hold all questions until the end, but please feel free to drop any questions you have as a comment in the comment section, um, and we'll address them at the end in a Q&A. Dr. Miller is a gynecologic oncologist at VCU Massey Cancer Center and VCU Health where her clinical specialties include surgery and chemotherapy for gynecologic cancers. And her interests include robotic surgery, surgical education, and molecular diagnostics. She earned her medical degree at the VCU School of Medicine, completed a residency at Yale New Haven Hospital, followed by a fellowship at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for joining us this evening. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And yes, um, this is our um, Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month and day today. Um, and so I'm so thankful to be able to talk about what's going on in our world um, right now for our patients. There's been so much happening um, of the past um, few years. And so there's just so much to talk about. And so um, I will kind of give a glance into um, uh, what we've got going on, but um, there will be, there's so much more out there. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so it's, I'm so thankful also to be back in Virginia um, and from here, I went to medical school here. And so we just love uh, being able to collaborate with um, our different providers all over the state. And so, um, and teal is our color. I have no disclosures today. Um, and so just to briefly to talk about an outline. So. We're gonna start talking about what moving forward is looking like for all of oncologies and specifically our field, including precision oncology and targeted therapy and what that means. We're gonna highlight some of our disease sites um, and talk about screening, prevention and treatment. So ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer and cervical cancer today. We're gonna to talk about some addressing some disparities um, that we see in all types of cancer and specifically our cancers talk about um, clinical trials and what's going on here at BC or at Massey Cancer Center. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask us, what is precision oncology? What, um, what does targeted therapy mean? Um, and how did you all, you know, figure all of that out? So, you know, we're kind of still, I think at the very beginning of where we're going to go with all of this. It used to be that a lot of camp types of cancer, when we got a diagnosis, they were treated very similarly, or was just a little bit of variability to, between the stages. Now um, we have things called biomarkers, and biomarkers are characteristics of either the patient or the tumor. Um, but it's measured at a, it's an indication of a biologic process or a pathogenic, meaning a not normal process, or um, a response to an intervention or exposure. And specifically, these can be lab tests, genetic tests. Um, they can be characteristics or a genetic makeup of a tumor or characteristics of a patient. And these can predict if the cancer is going to respond to a certain type of therapy, either the standard of care or something that's um, more cutting edge. It can predict prognosis. Um, it can provide for an individual plan for a patient. Um, and it can definitely be incorporated into clinical trial design. Um, and also can inform, you know, even family members about things to look out for or even the potential need for genetic testing. And so this has been an exciting time for us as more of these become available. Um, and so this has also shifted the way that we do clinical trials. So while we have standard ways that we do clinical trials um, in this country and throughout the world, and those are usually done in phases, we also have um, different types of trials that incorporate these biomarkers. So um, a basket trial, which is when an eligibility is determined by the presence of that biomarker rather than where the cancer is coming from. So in this picture, you can see a uh, lung tumor, a liver tumor, 
brain tumor and a colon tumor all have the same mutation. So they are all eligible to receive a study drug in one trial. Whereas in an umbrella trial, it's the same site of disease, but they may be eligible for different um, medications due to the mutations that they have in each of those different types of tumor. So it's a real, again, really exciting time um, in oncology because um, these things are happening very quickly and changing a lot about treatment. And then something else exciting that's been going on is the concept of immunotherapy, which you may have heard or seen commercials for. Um, and this is essentially how we activate our own immune system um, to turn on to attack um, cancer cells. The reason that cancer is able to grow unchecked in the body is because it has very specific ways of evading the immune system, meaning it can mask itself to us, to our own body, recognizing that it's not normal. And so, for instance, um, these receptors that would normally fit together and would, would turn off our immune cells against the tumor, you can block that um, with certain types of medications. And so that way the tumor or the immune cells can recognize that the tumor is not normal. And it can help you again, um, recognize um, that the tumor is not normal and your body can actually kill the cancer cells itself, which um, is great and a very exciting um, concept in cancer treatment. And we have examples of all of these different types of concepts in um, all of our gynecological cancer sites. Um, in ovary and fallopian tube cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, and vaginal cancer, which is similar to cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, and even in a rare type of tumor called gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. So again, very exciting time um, for both the changing of standard of care of treatment and also the clinical trials that we have going on. So I want to start by talking about um, ovarian cancer because um, this is, a, again, so much has happened in the last couple of years to really change how we treat patients and also the prognosis of ovarian cancer. Um, ovaries go through a lot over the lifetime of a woman, typically, um, and ultimately they, most, our population, in our population, about one to two percent um, of women will develop ovarian cancer. Um, and you know, ovarian cancer is difficult because it's unable to be diagnosed typically until there's some sort of surgical intervention. And so we can't typically biopsy it unless we know for sure what it is. So that means that five to 10% of women during their lifetime will have to undergo a surgery for suspected ovarian cancer of some kind. Now, not all of them will have it, but a surgery is still a big deal for a lot of patients. So 60,000 of these surgeries are done per year. Um, and about 12 to 40 percent of women um, who are referred to us will ultimately have a ovarian cancer. So that means that a lot of our patients that are referred to us for an ovarian mass or concern do not have the can do not have a cancer. It still means a lot of anxiety and um, and a difficult time with these patients. And then just to bring up one more thing, that there is some emerging data that the majority or maybe half of ovarian cancer is actually coming from the fallopian tubes. Um, and so we can lower the risk um, for that type of cancer with tubal ligation for contraception earlier in life or removing the tubes. And you can also lower the risk of these cancers with four plus years of any type of hormonal contraception. Um, and then this is one of those um, exciting things in uh, this disease site now. The concept of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer is not a new one. However, um, we know that um, about 50% of high grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most common type, um, have alterations in some type of, in some DNA repair genes. This is called um, homologous recombination deficiency. And that's a fancy term, but essentially this is um, very important because a lot of these are genetic related, sometimes in um, you as a person or sometimes in a tumor. And it's also an excellent target for um, treatment. And so we're going to talk more about that. The most common types of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer are the BRCA mutations. And as you can see, they have a lot of risks um, for different types of cancer over their lifetime. But 
preventing cancer, they have a 30 to 60% chance for BRCA1 and a 16 to 27% um, chance for BRCA2. And so this is something um, that we uh, stress getting evaluated if you have a family history um, of ovarian cancer or a strong family history of breast cancer or these other types of cancers noted. Um, but it's also important, again, for our patients who are referred to us with ovarian cancer already. And that's important because we want to make sure um, that they get the right treatment, um, but also that their family members get screened. Um, and um, you can manage the risk even without a diagnosis of ovarian cancer by having risk-reducing surgery. And this is very important because um, if a patient is diagnosed with a mutation um, because they have a strong family history, we can actually dramatically reduce their risk of getting these types of cancers, specifically ovarian cancer, by, um, by removing their ovaries and tubes um, by the age of 35 to 40 with the RCA1 or 40 to 45, um, or about that range with the RCA2. Interestingly, here at um, BCU, we have a, clinic, a surgical clinical trial evaluating, um, again, back to that concept of fallopian tube versus ovary cancer, um, the outcomes if uh, these patients just have their tubes removed or they have their ovaries and tubes removed um, together. So this is um, an exciting concept and so we encourage you or um, anyone you know with this concern to come and have a surgical consultation uh, with us for that reason. There's also other um, familial cancer syndrome, syndromes that are um, important to see us for um, because again we can reduce the risk of um, a very difficult disease. And so what if you do have those, one of those mutations, uh, but you're not ready to have surgery yet, there's not excellent evidence about how to um, specifically screen for ovarian cancer. It's very difficult to screen for. However, it's acceptable to see um, one of us and obtain um, ultrasounds and a C125 lab test, um, starting you know in the, in the 30s. Um, but ultimately, yes, um, we do recommend surgery at some point. Um, so if we can prevent ovarian cancer, and we haven't really ever been shown to be able to do that very well in any of the trials that have looked at that, how do we treat it? So typically when someone is presenting to us, um, they um, have had some imaging findings and we help to make them, help them make a decision about whether surgery first would be better for them, uh, followed by chemotherapy or should they start with chemotherapy to get them a better chance of having a complete resection of their cancer? And that's what's the biggest goal. Um, and so we help make that decision and we review that um, with our partners and at a multidisciplinary meeting as well. Um, so after you get you know, surgery and chemotherapy, um, what can we do? So now what, are we just done or is there something else we can do? And we call this an opportunity for improvement because that was the standard of care for a very long time. Um, and so this is where that personalized treatment comes into play. So um, the concept of maintenance therapy has been a big shift in this field. So that's extending therapy with a goal of prolonging survival without disease. So that's maintaining a treatment response. After all that treatment you went through in the surgery um, and you have no disease at this point, you want to maximize that response. And also the concept of maximizing quality of life at this point, we don't want to give you something that also causes you to have a lot of side effects and toxicity. So there's several um, uh, options depending on the situation. There's new uh, medications called PARP inhibitors. There's anti-angiogenics um, like bevacizumab, which is something we can talk about. And even um, the concept of that immunotherapy that we talked about earlier. And also where you have treatment matters. Um, there's very good data that shows that with advanced disease in particular, there's survival benefits when patients have surgery with a GYN oncologist um, compared to other types of surgeons. And that in general, uh, treatment at specialized centers for our types of cancers are associated with better survival. Um, so it is important to get to a GYN oncologist. Um, and briefly, I mentioned PARP inhibitors before. So this is a type of medication that's come out recently in the last 10 years. Um, and essentially, it's a type of medication um, that targets an enzyme that repairs uh, breaks in DNA or mistakes that are made during replication, which is very common in every cell when it replicates. But we, most people have an excellent way of repairing that or 
in fact, many, many ways of repairing that. So these medications um, inhibit um, that ability for the um, for that enzyme to repair the DNA. So then, um, uh, essentially, there if the tumor cell, if we're talking about a tumor cell, can't repair its DNA, it will lead to cell death. In patients that have that type of mutation, homologous for combination uh, deficiency, or that would also be BRCA patients, um, the, again, the tumors can't make that repair if that enzyme is inhibited, meaning that the, the cells die. And that's a really complicated mechanism, but essentially it means that these PARP inhibitors work really well in these patients with these specific mutations, either um, a genetic mutation um, that's been passed down to them, or even if the tumor has its own mutation. So that's very exciting. Um, and that has led to an immense amount of, of FDA approvals for medications um, in ovarian cancer for the last few years. And as you can see previous um, to this, um, it was maybe one drug per decade for a long time. And now this acceleration has been going on, which again is extremely exciting. Um, and this is just, this is a very busy slide and it's very complicated, but just an example of what's been going on. So SOLO1 um, was a study that was done um, on BRCA patients. Um, and they were given that maintenance treatment with a PARP inhibitor after they finished their chemotherapy. What we're looking at here is there's two lines here. Um, and these lines um, each represent a type of patient. So the top line um, measures uh, the patients that receive the study drug, that's a PARP inhibitor. And the bottom line um, measures what happens to patients who did not receive um, that medication. So the important part of this slide is that um, at 60 months since the beginning of the study, 50% of the patients who received that medication have not had a recurrence of their cancer, whereas only 21% of the patients who did not receive the medication have not had a recurrence, meaning that five years out um, from finishing their chemotherapy, 50% of these patients with advanced ovarian cancer did not have their cancer come back. And as you can see, the difference here is astounding. And so this has been an incredible um, breakthrough in this um, type of cancer. And there has been, there have been many different studies looking at different PARP inhibitors um, in this type of population. So we're very excited about this um, information and um, there's a lot of ways that we use it. So here at BCU, we test for those hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes at the time of the confirmation of diagnosis. And that's typically a blood test. And again, we do this either at the time of the hospitalization for the patient's surgery. So that means literally you would have your surgery for your um, ovarian or fallopian tube cancer. And then within the next few days in the hospital, um, our fantastic nurse navigator would come speak um, with the patient about um, the findings and the recommendation for the testing and actually draw the labs right there and send them off. And if the patient is not having chemo or surgery first and instead having chemotherapy, we would do that at the time of initial consultation once we have confirmation of the diagnosis. And if this testing is negative, we can actually send the tumor directly again for the specific testing. And that also helps us to make these plans. So we want this, um, these results returned early in treatment so that we can help make these really exciting treatment and maintenance therapy decisions and again, inform clinical trial eligibility. And this is awesome because we also have a pharmacist, pharmac a pharmacist and dedicated nursing team that helps us um, to coordinate this and, and um, start these medications if you're eligible. So it's a very exciting time in GYN oncology. And here at BCU again with um, in ovarian cancer, um, we have six trials currently open and they're both in the upfront meaning at that initial point in treatment and also in the setting of recurrent cancer. We don't have time to talk about recurrent ovarian cancer right now and everything that we have going on there. But um, if you can imagine from what we've talked about just in the upfront setting, how much we, um, how much innovation we also have if um, the cancer does recur. Um, so it's, it's brought a lot of hope um, to us and our patients. Um, and so again, um, just a really exciting time in this disease site. Yeah, and then to talk a little bit about uterine cancer as well. Um, endometrial cancer is on the rise in the United States. Um, and 
um, you can see in 2007, um, it was, um, you know, responsible for about 39,000 cases. Um, and now in 2017, we're seeing 61,000 cases. So that is um, a huge um, increase. Um, and, you know, the, the other problem with uterine cancer is that we are seeing a disparity and I um, didn't have um, enough time to go into this in detail, but in terms of um, the differences in um, the uh, types of cancer, the stage and the outcomes for happening to patients um, of different um, uh, racial and ethnic groups. And so this is very important and a huge um, interest of um, a lot of our research here in BCU, especially in uterine cancer. Um, one of the concepts in endometrial cancer that has been new over the past um, few years, um, starting about a decade ago, was that um, doing uh, specific research on these tumors has revealed that there's basically four distinct categories of um, endometrial cancer. And this matters because we're finding out over time um, that they respond differently and they act differently. And so it's not just about the stage and what type of cell it is. It's about how it looks at the level of its molecular signature, which is, again, getting back to that precision uh, medicine. Um, and so, you know, depending on what type of tumor it is, um, you know, most patients are going to have surgery. Some may need chemotherapy, radiation, or a combination of that and um, very exciting time in neutral cancer as well um, is the concept of immunotherapy here as well, which we talked about earlier. Here at BCU, um, and uh, again, we don't have time to get very detailed about it, but we have um, the concept of minimally invasive surgery, which is really been adopted as the standard of care if possible in uterine cancer, which means that even for cancer surgery, you can have a very um, extensive uh, staging surgery for uterine cancer and move um, the uterus, ovaries, and tubes, and cervix, and um, perform biopsies through four to five small incisions um, and actually go home the same day. Um, we also um, utilize the sentinel lymph node um, algorithms, and that means that um, instead of removing all of the lymph nodes in the pelvis and um, the abdomen um, to ensure that there hasn't been any um, metastatic spread, we can actually use a specialized technique to just remove um, a couple of lymph nodes that will tell us whether or not um, there has been any, any spread. And that avoids the um, significant side effects um, that can come from having a significant amount of lymph nodes removed. So this, again, has been an exciting time in a neutral cancer. I mean, again, we have many clinical trials that we're going to talk about um, that are really moving the field forward. And also, um, sometimes we recommend ra radiation therapy either before or after treatment um, or after surgery. And um, the concept of brachytherapy, which is delivering a um, high dose of radiation to a very small area um, to prevent a recurrence or to treat a tumor. Um, and we have a really expert team here. Just wanted to highlight a few clinical trials that we have going on. Um, so the first one, uh, GUG3053, and we have a lot of numbers and letters here, and don't worry about that. But essentially, um, the first study is looking at um, the addition of that immunotherapy um, to uh, chemotherapy in um, patients with newly diagnosed high-risk endometrial cancer after their surgery. And so that could give access, um, potential access to an immunotherapy. Again, which we talked about can target some very specific um, uh, biomarkers in the tumors. Um, and so um, it's a really exciting trial talking about cha potentially changing the standard of care. Similarly, we have um, NRG GY018, which is also a randomized controlled study looking at the addition of immunotherapy that Pembrolizumab. had. Um, to standard of care chemotherapy for, the, and this is in the situation of patients who have um, not completely resected disease. So that's always um, a difficult situation to be in, and patients um, often have um, a lot of questions about what that means. But this means, this trial means that you're still eligible um, to potentially receive again this immunotherapy early on in the process. And finally, GOG3055, um, and this is a randomized. Uh, 
controlled trial again, phase three, and this is maintenance therapy. Um, again, we talked about that with ovarian um, cancer before. And so this is, um, you know, taking that concept to uterine cancer. And that's with um, this medication called Selenexor um, versus a placebo. Um, in, after chemotherapy for patients who have, um, again, presented with advanced recurrent endometrial cancer. Um, and even um, uh, patients with carcinosarcoma type tumors are eligible. And so these are all really exciting uh, trial designs for our patients. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about cervical cancer, um, which has been another uh, tumor with an extreme um, growth in the data over the last um, decade and um, has been a very exciting time as well. I just wanted to touch briefly on the fact that cervical cancer, um, there are a lot of risk factors for this um, tumor, the number one being exposure to HPV. And HPV um, is a virus that's quite ubiquitous, we know that, and it's the reason why we have screening. Um, and so the number one risk factor for cervical cancer is um, never having been screened for cervical dysplasia, meaning, you know, abnormal cells in the cervix or pre-cancer or cancer itself. And that um, can be a result of uh, poor access to health care um, and low socioeconomic status. And that, um, again, is where those um, health care disparities play in. And um, again, we don't have time to get into it but, um, today, but there is so much going on at BCU to help with the access um, to screening and to getting treated for these pre-cancer conditions to avoid um, ever having to be treated for cervical cancer. Um, another risk factor is history of cervical dysplasia, which is that um, ab those abnormal cells, sometimes pre-cancerous cells, a history of having abnormal pap tests in the past, um, depending on the sexual history of the patient, a history of sexually transmitted infections, which are associated with HPV infection, history of antigenital warts, just being immunocompromised in general, um, because then that HPV virus is able to change the cells um, in a way that can lead to that um, cervical dysplasia or pre-cancer. Smoking um, is a big risk factor for dis both dysplasia and cancer. And um, rarely um, history of uh, in utero uh, DES exposure, which was a, a medication given years ago. So if we, again, if we don't prevent um, cervical cancer um, for uh, reasons like not having appropriate screening or um, different types of tumors um, that didn't initially uh, present during the screening period, we have excellent treatment options. And it really depends mostly on the stage um, and the type of tumor again. And so when we first see a patient with suspected cervical cancer or um, confirmed diagnosis of cervical cancer, um, we evaluate that stage and the optimal um, treatment options. And this is going to involve things like specialized scans, biopsies, um, examination, um, and it can seem overwhelming in the beginning. And um, I think what's hardest um, for us when we work with our patients is, and this is for all types of cancer, but particularly cervical cancer, is patients want to get their treatment, um, you know, the day that they need us. And the most important thing with, with I say with all, um, when I meet all of my, can my cancer patients for the first time, is we're going to do this um, as fast as we can safely, but we have to get it right. And so, um, sometimes that means that we have to take a minute and get you know, a lot of imaging studies done. Um, and also, um, we may need to wait a few days to get the exact answers that we need. And treatment can be surgery. Um, and in cer certain circumstances, we can even spare fertility for these patients. Uh, not all, but, but some. Um, we may use radiation, chemotherapy. We have clinical trials, and we may have a combination of all of these things, and um, in particular, that immunotherapy that we talked about before. Here at BCU, um, I just wanted to highlight a clinical trial. So we, in the upfront setting, have GOG 3047. So this is for um, high risk or locally advanced cervical cancer, um, <clears throat> or stage three to four um, A cancer. Um, and that utilizes chemo radiation, again, randomized controlled trial, meaning you may get access to immunotherapy at the time of treatment. 
and this is also given um, for a time period beyond the end of the radiation treatment. And the exciting thing about cervical cancer is there are, again, everything is changing very quickly here. There are many ongoing um, current and future trials and FDA approvals happening very quickly. Um, in fact, we're getting you know, emails daily about um, new trials coming out and the suspected FDA approvals that are coming very soon. And again, I wanted to highlight our radiation oncology team, uh, which here offers the most advanced techniques to help control the disease, help with symptoms, and they're also excellent at minimizing our side effects um, that we can have from radiation, which is also very important to our patients. So um, I just want to highlight their contribution to what we do because it's so, so important. And again, I wanted to touch back on how important this immunotherapy can be in cervical cancer. And so when I talk about it, what I mean is the concept of, you know, the clinical trials that we're looking at now, a lot of the times is that we are kind of putting all of the factors about these tumors together and making that personalized treatment plan with those biomarkers. So if the HPV um, caused this this uh, pre-cancer and ultimately the cancer, how can we kind of harness that, um, the fact that that HPV was able to evade the immune system and how can we turn on again the immune system to uh, helping to target the cancer cells within our own bodies. And so part of that is giving the radiation um, and also, you know, chemotherapy sometimes help that radiation work but then also maybe giving immunotherapy at the same time to, again, help the body unmask those cancer cells and let our immune cells uh, take on part of the, um, the, the treatment of, of these cancers. And specifically in cervical cancer, just going beyond immunotherapy, there are new and exciting things happening. So um, there are uh, targeted drugs looking at that are not immunotherapy, like I said, they are um, actually antibody conjugates, meaning that they target specific factors within the cells. So in cervical cancer, a lot of these cells um, express something called tissue factor. And so uh, there's even this drug called tisodenapagotin, which um, targets that a receptor on the cell, is able to um, get inside the cell um, and actually causes uh, the cells to stop replicating and to actually um, die. And they can also interact with other uh, immune, immune cells and also other uh, adjacent tumor cells to cause cell death. So this is, again, is a very exciting concept, um, especially if patients already received immunotherapy um, and they're, uh, they need uh, to look at a different option. And so this is a really busy slide about a clinical trial that was done um, on this uh, specific medication called Tocidinam. But essentially, it's a really exciting thing because uh, these patients who had advanced or metastatic cancer were given this type of drug, and it was uh, seen that they did have a good response, and again, with minimal side effects. So here at BCU, we actually, again, have a randomized clinical trial of this medication, Tocidinam versus um, standard of care chemotherapy, again, in second or third line recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer. So this is for patients who um, have recurred or progressed um, through other types of treatment. And again, we still have an option for them. So um, again, this is a really exciting um, development and again, an exciting time in our field. Um, I just wanna highlight the fact that um, we, again, have a lot of clinical trials here, and um, we have a lot of clinical trial experts. And so um, if you are looking for a clinical trial for yourself or for um, a family member, a friend, um, anyone you know, we have a website, um, which is, again, I put up on the screen now, um, where you can actually access um, all of our open clinical trials uh, right there. And it's actually really simple. It will take you to this website. You can click on the site of disease that you're um, looking for a clinical trial and just click search. And then it will, um, you'll be able to see um, all of the open clinical trials in each disease site. 
um, and you can actually click on them and get more information. You can see if they're enrolling. We can find out who the primary investigator is um, and how to get in contact with us about it. I just wanted to highlight our team specifically. Um, so there are three GYN oncologists here. So um, Dr. Randall is our um, division director um, and a clinical trial expert who's recognized internationally for her work. Um, and so she is an excellent resource that we have here um, to be able to provide our patients with uh, cutting edge treatments and access to these excellent trials. Dr. Sullivan is also um, one of our GYN oncologists and um, is in also um, very interested in clinical trials and again brings um, her own expertise in that area and also um, surgical expertise as well as we all do. Um, and then I'm the third GYN oncologist as well. Um, Dr. Fields is our radiation oncologist. Dr. Gordon also is here um, and has an excellent clinical trial experience um, and provides even um, some additional clinical trial options um, in the phase one round, which we can talk about. Um, and then we have an amazing um, clinical research nurse um, named Sonia Washington, who um, is just an incredible um, asset to our team and our patients, um, especially when we're screening for clinical trials and getting to know um, our patients who are interested. Um, we have multiple care center locations as well, um, and we have a direct line for uh, patients wanting appointments or bringing referrals. And so with that, I'd like to um, take um, a minute to thank you and um, ask if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, a lot to unpack there, so appreciate you giving this presentation. Um, we'll open the floor for a little Q&A. Um, we'll read anything that someone submitted in the comments, and we had a few submitted in advance, so we'll read those first. Um, is it better to seek care for gynecologic cancers from a gynecologic oncologist rather than my regular OD guy? That's a really excellent question. So um, our OBGYN colleagues are really um, often how our patients get to us. So they are um, excellent at uh, seeing you and evaluating your symptoms. And if they're suspicious um, and they do their own workup with imaging or a lab test or an examination, um, they often decide that um, the patients need to come see us for further care, surgery, uh, or treatment. But um, if you have a diagnosed uh, GYN cancer, there is evidence that yes, um, patients do um, survive longer if they're um, treated by a GYN oncologist. But again, our OBGYN colleagues are really excellent about sending patients to us that they have any concern about. Okay. Who should consider getting genetic testing? Great question. Um, and I. You know, didn't have time to get totally um, into this into this presentation today, but there are a lot of reasons for um, genetic counseling and testing. We have an excellent genetic um, testing and counseling program here at BCU, and we work very closely with them, as you can tell by the amount that we um, that that matters for treatment and um, and for um, our patients, but for us specifically, any patient with ovarian cancer is going to be revert refer for genetic testing, partially because of all those reasons that I mentioned about treatment, but also because, again, of that high rate of um, uh, genetic reasons for the tumor. So there's um, there are excellent resources about um, how to know if you should um, be tested for a genetic reason for a cancer or to see if you're at risk. Um, the NCCN um, has an excellent um, tool for this. Um, and there are multiple um, online resources, which I can um, provide, but um, basically, if you have a strong family history of cancer, um, this, for me, you know, breast and ovarian cancer it matters, talk to your doctor about whether or not you think that, um, whether or not they think that you should go for testing. The other um, syndromes, you know, that, that we deal with a lot are, are something like Lynch syndrome, which is a hereditary colon cancer syndrome, which is a high rate of endometrial cancer as well. So again, um, if you're concerned um, and you have a strong family history, um, talk to your primary care doctor, your OBGYN, about whether or not uh, they think you would qualify for testing. Okay. So you mentioned this a little bit 
already, um, but could you kind of highlight some of the controllable risks as well as some of the uncontrollable risk factors? Great question. So um, in terms of the different types of cancers, um, they, they vary a little bit. So if we're talking about ovarian cancer, obviously we can't control um, you know, our genetics, so our specific genes, and if we have a mutation that may at some point in life potentially cause an ovarian cancer or breast cancer or any type of cancer. But um, if we are worried about um, a family history, um, talking to your doctor and getting that testing um, would allow you to potentially control your risk because if you were found to have a genetic reason for, um, for those familial cancers, then you could have surgery to reduce your risk. Um, and again, that can be done by one of us. It's a specific surgery, um, and it's it's usually uh, same day surgery, and then you can reduce your risk again from those numbers we were talking about on the order of twenty to sixty percent down to like one to three percent, which is uh, really amazing. The other things to look at for things like ovarian cancer would be um, uh, if. Um, you have a uh, tubal ligation, meaning um, if you have your tubes tied at the time of a delivery, you can reduce your risk by 50%. Um, having uh, breast, having been um, pregnant or breastfed four to five uh, children during your life actually reduces your risk. Um, also taking any form of hormonal contraception, meaning birth control pills, um, uh, anything that prevents you from having um, a regular cycle within your ovary for about four to five years during your life reduces your risk. Anytime you cannot smoke, um, that is also good at preventing um, almost all types of cancer, but specifically ovary, cervical cancer, and endometrial cancer. And then seeing doctors regularly is so important, um, and that, that can also be part of controlling your risk factors. And there's a lot more we can talk about with you know, risk factors for cancer, but again, being within care and getting your screening if you need it and when you're supposed to is, is so important. Okay. So you definitely mentioned what type of clinical trials are now available. Um, but more importantly, why should women consider um, these clinical trials? That is an excellent question. And the short answer is that there's so many reasons um, and the long answer is that um, clinical trials are amazing because um, they are what is moving our field forward. Um, and I think a lot of times when we think about the words clinical trial, it can be a little bit scary because it sounds like it's experimental and nobody wants the feeling of being experimented on and we're very sensitive to that. Um, however, what clinical trials can give you is access to medications that we know probably are going to work um, to help with a certain type of tumor. We don't always know, we're testing it, but um, it can give you access to a medication um, that's the standard of care plus um, another medication. And that's, that's a really cool concept that otherwise a lot of patients wouldn't have access to. And frankly, they have access to you know, a research team, research nurse, um, a specific protocol, um, for you know when they they do everything and everything is watched um, really closely by not only us here which we always do but at you know a national trial level and then the the other exciting thing about all of it is that um, you have the ability to potentially help um, future patients move towards the future move you know oncology into the future for future patients and you know some patients that's really something that's appealing to them but I think overall, the thing that scares you know most patients again is that idea of that experimental um, word. And I again, we understand that. But knowing that it really is, you're going to always get the standard of care on the trial. It's just that you may even be able to move beyond. So, so you showed us the website earlier in the presentation. Um, but would you also suggest um, patients ask their doctors about clinical trials? Absolutely. So um, you can probably tell that we're going to be talking about them a lot with our patients here. But if you're being treated somewhere else, um, or if you are um, 
kind of be starting the process of oncology care or you know someone that does, absolutely ask your physician, your primary care doctor, um, your OBGYN, your GYN oncologist, anywhere about um, about talking about clinical trials because again we have the ability to see patients um, and, and talk to you about them even remotely sometimes. Um, it's, just, it's a really amazing thing that you can um, you can find out a lot about um, again through the website but also like you said um, through your physician. Okay, great. Um, what should patients know about cancer and fertility? That's a really great question. So um, I think this is one of the hardest things that any um, oncologist would probably say that they deal with. And I, you know, we treat a lot of young women um, in uh, GYN oncology. And so what's important is that you ask. Um, if you have, if you're being seen by one of us or by another oncologist for any type of cancer, we want to know um, what your what your desires are, what you, what you see your future as being, because we have a lot of options for our patients. We work with an excellent um, reproductive endocrinology and infertility group here who's able to see our patients very quickly. Um, and so if we see a patient for a consultation for a new diagnosis of cancer, um, we prefer them to see uh, the back room quickly and so they can help them review their options depending on what we recommend. And there's so many options uh, for our patients. Um, like I said, specifically our patients, but also our patients with other cancers. But like I said, um, sometimes you do have to be an advocate for yourself. And I wanna make sure that patients know that they should ask and that it's important. Um, and that it's just, it's another part, you know, of what we do. And what I always say is what's important to you is important to me too. So right. Okay. Is the HPV vaccine effective in preventing cervical cancer? That's a really great question. Um, and I did want to touch on that today. Um, so I'm glad that this question came up. Um, the HPV vaccine is very effective in preventing uh, cervical precancer, so cervical dysplasia, and also cervical cancer. There are multiple uh, clinical trials that have looked at this, and our most recent data suggests that it is probably about 90% effective in preventing um, cervical dysplasia and cancer. And so we highly recommend it. Um, and also, there is some emerging data that it may also um, help to treat cervical disclosure of the cancer um, with the addition to that standard of care. So that's kind of, um, again, all of this data is, is coming out since those trials have been done, um, you know, starting um, decades ago. But again, um, our hope is that eventually there is no more cervical cancer because we're able to prevent almost all of it with these vaccines. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit about some screenings. Um, can any of these cancers be detected through a pap test? It's a great, um, great question. So uh, pap test is really the, um, the screening test for a cervical, abnormal cervical cells in the cancer. Um, a pap test is something called cytology, meaning it just looks at individual cells. If the PAP test is abnormal, which is done for routine screening, um, then sometimes your doctor will recommend a biopsy, and a biopsy can determine if someone has cervical cancer. The other thing about PAP tests is sometimes if they have a certain type of abnormal cells, they may give us a clue that there could be an underlying uterine cancer. So yes, it can um, help in the detection, but the, the real purpose for a PAP test is prevent even getting to that point. And that's, again, our goal for all of our patients. OK, great. Well, Dr. Miller, I think that's all the questions we have. So it was such a pleasure having you join us for this discussion. Um, we were able to learn a little more about the advanced treatment options and clinical research regarding gynecologic cancers at VCU Health and Massey Cancer Center. Um, to the audience, if you want to learn more about Dr. Miller and Massey, you can visit vcuhealth.org or follow at VCU Health and at VCU Massey Cancer Center. Um, once again, thank you, Dr. Miller, and to everyone who joined us this, this evening. Have a great night. Thank you.